Hi guys, welcome again to Intellect Miracles, where learning is made easy. I'm Dr. Chirak Madan. So today we'll be discussing about pneumothorax. As the name says, pneumo means air and thorax, as you all know, is the thoracic cavity. Now in pneumothorax, what happens is actually abnormal collection of air in the pleural cavity. Now let's see the anatomy. This is the lung. Then this lung is having a uh, covering with pleura. Inside is the visceral one and outside is the parietal pleura. Now, if you have a rent or a hole either in the parietal or the visceral pleura, then yes, the air can come inside the pleural cavity and can have a ball valve mechanism where the air is just entering and is not able to egress. Right? And then the air, that abnormal air that keeps on accumulating inside that pleural cavity, further compressing the lung as you can see in this diagram, right? So the, the lung is actually compressed. Now, in this video, I'll be discussing why it happens, what are the causes, what are the risk factors, what are the types of it, how to diagnose it clinically, and also the main part is the treatment, which is very, very, very important clinically and also for our MCQs or the medical examinations. Now starting with it, so that was just the basic about pneumothorax. If you talk about the types, it is categorized into two main, which is the spontaneous pneumothorax, the other is either the traumatic or iatrogenic. Under the category of uh, spontaneous pneumothorax, we have further two subcategories, which is primary pneumothorax and secondary pneumothorax. The primary pneumothorax actually means that there is no underlying pathology of the lung, and it is usually seen in young, thin, and tall patients. Whereas, if you talk about the secondary pneumothorax, th that happens whenever you have underlying lung pathology, as in cases if, let's say, patient have bulla or uh, emphysema or COPD or asthma or cystic fibrosis. So there is some underlying pathology, then we refer it as secondary pneumothorax. And if you come on to the other side, that means traumatic or iatrogenic. In that, if patient have a stab injury or let's say gunshot injury, right? So then there is a traumatic or just after road traffic accident or even after the IJV cannulation. So these come under traumatic category, right? And whenever this abnormal accumulation of air inside the pleural cavity is so high, the pressure is so high, and which is causing the mediastinal shift or the tracheal shift and uh, is compressing onto the heart or the vascular structures, causing hemodynamic compromise, then that is referred as tension pneumothorax. So these were the types of pneumothorax. Now, we need to know how to approach these kind of patients. Starting with, first and foremost, is the clinical history. So we need to know what is the history of the patient, whether there is any kind of trauma or any kind of lung pathology previously, like bulla or emphysema or COPD. So you need to have a good clinical history. Secondly, you will see the clinical symptoms and also the signs. With the symptoms, usually the patients with pneumothorax, sometimes they are asymptomatic and majority of times they will be complaining of dyspnea or problem with the breathing, right? So that is referred as dyspnea. So uh, I'm talking about the clinical signs. These patients can be having increased respiratory rate, which is tachypnea or, or they can be tachycardia also associated. Now you need to go ahead with clinical examination, which you should perform before going ahead with investigation where you are suspecting pneumothorax. On inspection, there will be reduced chest expansion, right, on that, on that same particular side. Second, you will go ahead with palpation of that area. Maybe there can be road traffic accident, they can be damaged or uh, broken ribs. And yes, patient can feel that pain, there, there can be tenderness over that area, right? Third, coming on to the percussion, there will be hyper resonant uh, sound, right? Fourth, you will go ahead with auscultation and there will be reduced air entry, right? And if you go ahead with vocal fremitus, that is also reduced. So this clinical examination is very important. Now, after clinical history and symptoms and signs, comes the third part, which is very, very important, the investigation. 
So whenever the patient comes to you with uh, these complaints and you suspect pneumothorax and if associated hemodynamic compromise is there, then you don't go with the investigation like chest x-ray or CT scan. You don't have time for that, right? And unless you don't have a, a portable x-rays in, in your emergencies or uh, with a digital uh, x-rays, which you which gives the image then and there. Otherwise, the best nowadays is the ultrasound machine. Right? It's with using the sonocyte machine. So at the bedside itself, you just scan the area and you get to know this is actually very, very, very good nowadays. And we all are using that in our day to day practice in the ICUs or in the emergencies. Right now, when we talk about the ultrasound machine, so if you uh, apply the probe, you can see the lung sliding. You can see the pleura moving uh, in a normal lung. If there is a pneumothorax, then that lung sliding is actually lost. Right. And if you talk about the M mode of ultrasound, and this is the typical picture you get whenever it is a lung, normal lung, that is a uh, seashore. This is called a seashore sign. Whereas if you talk about the pneumothorax, then you get this sign, which is called as barcode sign having straight lines. Right. So this is a barcode which we see on ultrasound. And it, this is important. Right. So whenever you just scan the, the lung at the bedside, if you see uh, horizontal lines, right? So, so that such as this is a barcode side and goes in favor of pneumothorax. And then ultimately, yes, if you have time, there is no such hemodynamic compromise. You can go ahead with chest X-ray. In the chest X-ray, as you can see on the image, uh, you have the, the very thin line, which is going to the dome of diaphragm, right? And there is no lung marking in the periphery. There it is more radiolucent and also absence of uh, lung markings, right? So, so this typical area is having abnormal collection of air inside your pleural cavity. And we can come to know how much is the volume of abnormal air in this pleural cavity using some methods, which are Collins method or Rias method or even the lights index method, right? So, so you have several index for that. I'll not be going much into that detail. Now, uh, this so we, we have discussed about uh, in the investigation. The first nowadays is the bedside sonocyte or the ultrasound machine. Then you go with the chest X-ray. Still, if you are not sure, right? And there is a minimal minimal uh, pneumothorax, and you think yes, it has not been uptaken on X-ray. Then yes, the further you go with CT scan, that will detect the minimal minimal amount of abnormal air, right? Even in the apical area or wherever it is present or even just the bullet, right? So, or the localated pneumothorax. So, CT scan is much, much better. So, then you go with HRCT chest. So, this was how you investigate. And next comes the last important part is the treatment. Because yes, you need to treat these patients, right? Otherwise, this can be life-threatening. Now, if this is so this is uh, dependent on which type of pneumothorax is it if it is primary pneumothorax then yes first and foremost you need to check how much is the size of pneumothorax on the x-ray and that is taken as two centimeters whether it is more than two centimeters or less than now comes the point from where you have to check this two centimeter so this is from the periphery to the center, right, where your pneumothorax, your abnormal air is there at the level of hilum, right? So if the rim from the periphery uh, is less than two centimeters and there is no respiratory discomfort or problem to the patient, then yes, you can discharge the patient and follow up in next two to four weeks, right? So this is in the primary pneumothorax, whenever there is no lung pathology and the size of pneumothorax is less than two centimeters without any respiratory symptoms. Now, if let's say the patient of primary pneumothorax has the rim of more than two centimeters or have respiratory discomfort, right? Then you go with aspirating using 16 to 18 gauge cannula. And then again, recheck. If it is still there, yes, you need to go ahead with ICD insertion, right? That is intercostal drainage. Whereas if aspiration, after aspiration, yes, the size has been resolved, it is less than two centimeters and there are no symptoms, then again, you can discharge the patient, right? So this is regarding the treatment uh, of primary pneumothorax and this is 
uh, from the reference of BMJ. So this is what is there in the guidelines for the management of primary pneumothorax, right? And this is what we do also. Now coming on to the secondary pneumothorax where there is underlying cause. And if the rim is more than two centimeters or the patient is breathless or having respiratory discomfort, then yes, you need to go ahead with ICD, that is intercostal drainage. So you insert a drain in the fifth intercostal uh, anterior to the mid axillary line. Right? So this is the ideal place for that. And if the, the rim is between one to two centimeters, then yes, you can go ahead with aspirating. If it is resolved, it becomes less than one centimeter, there's nothing to do. You just admit the patient and observe for 24 hours. Whereas if it is again uh, not resolved and uh, the, the size is increasing, the respiratory discomfort is increasing, ultimately you have to go with ICD drainage. And in the third scenario, if the rim is less than one centimeter, you just admit the patient, give supplemental oxygen and observe for next 24 hours. And you have to uh, give the supplemental oxygen for all the uh, all the secondary pneumothorax and admit the patient to the hospital. This is the main main treatment how you go about with spontaneous pneumothorax, right? But if this increases, this abnormal collection of air increases and it increases the pressure inside, right, and causing hemodynamic compromise, which is referred as tension pneumothorax, then yes you need to take care of that abnormal air there and then. You can't wait for x-ray, you can't wait for CT scan, you can't wait for uh, uh, someone to call consultant. You just have to treat there and then. You, you can't wait, right? That is, that can be life-threatening for the patient. And until unless you don't decompress, patient will deteriorate, the BP will crash down, the heart rate will, obviously that will be coming down, the saturation will come down, so patient will crash. So in that scenario, so previously it was being mentioned as needle decompression in the second intercostal at the mid-clavicular line. But now in uh, recent ATLS guidelines, which they have mentioned that whenever the thickness uh, of the skin is more or patient is obese, then it is better to directly go with fifth intercostal anterior to mid axillary line even for the needle decompression. Right, so so this, but some of the, the guidelines they are still following the second intercostal in the mid clavicular. So this was everything about the pneumothorax which you need to know. Right, talking about the types, how it is caused, then about the presentation, how you evaluate these patients, how you approach these patients, and also the treatment of these patients.